Hello, and welcome to the Amber Stitt Show, and I'm your host, Amber Stitt, and today we welcome back Iris Ortega, and we welcome Celeste Plumley to our show for the first time. Welcome, ladies. How are we doing today? Very well, thank you. Hi, Amber. Thank you for having Hi. us. All right, so, t so focusing on community is the fifth step of my Pathways of Peak Performance framework. So I thought it'd be great to have my friends here today from Live and Learn to share a little bit about Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And I thought it'd be a good idea to dive a little bit deeper into the domestic violence conversation because not only does it affect, affect households in general, but specifically women and children in Arizona. So this topic is near and dear to our hearts in the month of October for the Awareness Month, but it is more complex than, than just an Awareness Month. So I thought it would be great for Celeste to really bring some background, some facts, so that we can have a more of a, a thoughtful mindset about what is happening. And so we can, we can be proactive in, and learn how we can help and bring resources to people that might need this help as well. So that being said, Celeste, I'm gonna pass the mic to you and let you share a little bit about yourself and your background and how you help over at the Live and Learn organization. All right, thank you. So with my background specifically um, relates largely to my experiences as a survivor of domestic violence. Um, a lot of my work, uh, I am a, a social worker and a lot of my my path into um, getting involved and helping other people came from my experiences myself. Um, and then I've done a lot of work with other survivors, prepping them for telling their stories and talking about domestic violence in the community. Uh, because it's so important, I think, when those of us that have experienced it can add that added context of um, uh, breaking some of the myths, I think, of how, what we think of as people who have experienced domestic violence or what it is and, and how we feel protected from it, I think. I think when it's easy to say, oh, that wouldn't, well, I wouldn't let that happen, you know, or I wouldn't oh, let yeah. someone hit me or I wouldn't, that wouldn't, that could never be me then um, we can separate ourselves from people that are experiencing it um, in a way that can really be a barrier to, to helping and to healing as a society because it really is a social issue. We treat it like a personal issue when it is, it's behind closed doors and it happens within families, mm -hmm. but it happens systemically, you know, and it happens because um, of our culture and our society. And so there is a, a responsibility, I think, that we play in, in really understanding um, what domestic violence is. And um, yeah. so something like Domestic Violence Awareness Month is like the perfect opportunity to talk about. I mean, the statistics, you know, are, are often shared, you know, one in four women um, in the United States and in Maricopa County have experienced domestic violence that they report and that they identify and then they will talk about. And so there's a whole lot of domestic violence that happens that we don't realize is domestic violence or yeah. we don't say, you don't check the box on the form that says, yes, we've experienced that. So even though one in four number is really underreported, but you think about four women in your life that you care about, you know what I mean? And one of them right. you know, has been through this. That's a lot, it's a big impact. Well, hasn't it changed too in the last couple years? There is. I, I, there's been a lot happening post COVID with this and then mental illness too. So it, it's, it's certainly something that we just really need to be more thoughtful of. I think you helping women share their story is very powerful. I know that when I went through IVF and fertility, people may talk about it or they might not talk about it. But when I share about that, even with a lot of men in my industry, they'll share their stories because they've been affected too. So yeah. when, you, when you're able to do that, when it's time, when you feel that, that you're, you can, can do that, because it's not easy, it does, I think, that snowball effect of that, not, I don't wanna say positive, but it can really help people maybe take some action or participate and provide resources to people. So really appreciate you taking the time to, to do that because of, you know, it's very personal for you. Um, and so mm -hmm. I feel like you've mentioned a little bit, I almost feel like you're, you're touching on kind of that generational poverty, kind of that, you said something about systemic. So I know Iris, I'm going to have you share a little bit. So for those of 
the audience that hasn't met Iris yet on the first episode where she shares a lot about Live and Learn and the organization, there is a big focus on breaking that cycle of generational poverty, but you can see where that could be also another piece of this domestic violence situation. So there's kind of a com combined effort there that, that we really need to be helping others with. So Iris, let's have you share a little bit about what you do at Live and Learn, and then we'll dive into more of the heavier topic um, with Celeste again. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Iris Ortega, I'm the Community Engagement Manager at Live and Learn, and I love that you mentioned generational poverty. As you guys already might know, um, Live and Learn's mission is to break the cycle of generational poverty, so that's a, that's a huge focus for us, and definitely domestic violence is um, one of our main um, focuses, and so I love that Celeste is here to share with us, and you know, for anybody that didn't get that initial intro to Live and Learn, I invite you guys to go back and listen to that first episode and learn more specifically about the differences between generational poverty and situational poverty. Thank you. That'd be perfect. Um, and I have show notes and description boxes with some research. We'll link up as we um, as we talk about some of the things that that you guys do. I'll have um, the availability to share the URLs and then um, how people can get involved. So. Uh, Celeste, I think would it be a good place to start just talking about kind of what you see as maybe the background, kind of some history, and then um, ways that this is becoming, you know, has been a problem in Arizona? Yeah, so I think um, a lot of times when you think about domestic violence, we think about physical violence, right? And that's like the, you know, this outward manifestation. Um, and that a lot of times people consider that, well, it's not domestic violence is there, if there isn't physical violence. And the real um, core of domestic violence is power and control. And it is one person having power and control over another. And so, um, and in a, an abusive dynamic, there is a, a person with power and control and a person without it. Um, and so, we might see it as like, oh, it's a fight, you know, or it's just like mutual, like they're just setting each other off and it's just this, you know, mm -hmm. um, and people do fight and that is the dynamic in relationships that is not healthy. But in domestic violence specifically, there's somebody who is using coercion and um, intimidation, um, blaming, um, crazy making, you know, gaslighting, like doing everything they can to for this person that they're that is their victim to be helpless and to just really have like they kind of get their their identity stripped away from them right the things that yeah. they're, they're important to them get um they get separated from that you know relationships get broken they get isolated from their families um they start questioning like if they even understand you know, reality, you know, I mean, in extreme cases, it gets to the point where like, wow, like of really, truly being just kind of beaten down into somebody who um, doesn't recognize what their choices might be or, um, or be mm -hmm. really genuinely limited in, in where they can seek help. And so um, it's understanding that dynamic, I think, that is was so important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we think that, oh, somebody who is, you know, they grew up with domestic violence or they have a poor self-esteem and, you know, they're just, you know, like perpetrators are looking around for somebody who was like the most broken, saddest person in the room. And that's who they like pluck up to like destroy, you know, and it's really not the way that works. I mean, a lot of times, um, you know, if, if someone is really wanting to control somebody, then, you um, you know, they look for things like someone who is um, trusting, you know, maybe a certain mm. innocence, you know what I mean? More who, vulnerable. Who thinks that. Vulnerable. Yeah, absolutely. And we're taught, especially as women, like we're taught, I think about the Beauty and the Beast story, which I like, and, you know, the cartoon and the musical and all that. But like, there's this idea that if you love somebody enough, you know, you can get through that like rough exterior, you know, and you can like believe in this person point. and you see in them like their beauty and their light and like you want to you know and so somebody can capitalize on that you know what I mean on that like goodness mm -hmm. in you you know what I mean and flip it around to make it like you're the one that's causing the problems you're the abuser you're the you know what I mean and everything gets all twisted up and you're just like I don't even know what's going on anymore you know that's right. what domestic violence does to somebody you know so 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just so much more insidious than, you know what I mean? A, a fight might look like. And, uh, and I think if, that if we, um, understanding then how hard it is to get out of that is really important, you know, that it's not easy to just walk away. It's like this pattern. I just, my, my brain is going, we, we do all this. There's all these, um, whether it's a book or podcast or trying to build these healthier habits. So we do these things and we say to people, you can build the habit, just little steps. And every day, if you do something positive, your brain will get trained to do better. You're going to be, you're going to evolve. You'll, you'll grow as a person. But what, with what you're saying, what if the opposite is happening? Mm. We are there. This person, the abuser is training the person receiving this little every day, whatever it might be happening. It is training their brain to feel like they, they're not good enough and it's okay to be treated this way. And you could see how that could just spiral. Yeah. Um, can you share with us gaslighting? I know I've read the definition and I hear it a lot, but what is that? So if you could either share a story or explain it so that people, if they're listening here and they're going, oh my gosh, they can identify if that's happening in their world today. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's tricky. And I, I hear it used a lot when someone like disagrees mm -hmm. with, with you, you know what I mean? No, I mean, gaslight, yeah. you know, like, no, it's actually more <laughs> than just disagreeing. So it's when, um, like if, um, well, I'm going to just tell a personal story, I guess. I don't know. It feels very okay. vulnerable, but I will do this. So I was, I experienced domestic violence 20 years ago. I left the relationship a long time ago. Um, and it's still in my head, right? And I was with this guy for nine years and it's still definitely a part of my, you know, my waking reality, unfortunately, at times. And, but um, he would do this thing where like, you know, he would tell me, you know, every, everybody thinks you're crazy, right? You know that, right? Oh. And I'd be like, what? Like, I don't think so. Like, I'm, yeah, you know, and then um, he and then he like drop in something like, oh, well, I was talking to like my coworker and she was like, wow, like you're a girlfriend. Like, she's really like, she's kind of crazy, right? She seems pretty weird. Like, I don't know why you're with her. And he would like drop these things of like, and tell me like what other people said about me and like just, and and it got to this point where I was like, I, th I guess I'm, I'm crazy. Like, wow. Like I thought, I really thought I was all right, but all these other people are saying this and he's saying this. And like, and it was like the only input I was getting was him like planting this idea. I mean, it's brainwashing, right? He's like planting this idea in my head. And then I, and suddenly I was like, okay, I guess, wow. And I just, I adopted that. I believe that about myself. So that I was being gaslit. Like I was being told something that wasn't true with the intention of convincing me that mm -hmm. it was. It wasn't just like a, a manipulation, validating. It's a lie. It's a complete lie, but validating. Oh, so-and-so said it. So third party says it. So it must be true. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, it's that like the, yeah, it's like replacing someone's reality with a different mm -hmm. reality that they believe to be true because that's just everybody's swearing like the walls are gray and they're like I, really though i mean i guess for that's mm -hmm. white like no it's and they're like all right i guess i don't understand what gray is then that's okay wow that's interesting like this is was me this whole time you know and it's just and it Man, that's a rough one. That is so hard to get past because then, like you're saying, like you have to go in and, and like unlearn that. You feel alone because yeah. all these people are saying this about you and you're like, okay, how do I bounce this off somebody else? If, if He's telling you everyone's saying this and it's not true, but you might believe that if it you hear it enough. So Right. And then where can you go? Because everybody thinks you're crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. I recently, Iris, I might have told you about this book. I recently read Invisible Women. It talks a lot about just things that are designed from the beginning of time, whether it's infrastructure, products, and how women are left out of the conversation a bit. So I feel like, Celeste, when you're talking about this, I feel like women tend to get this. You're emotional. It, it, and the reason I bring up the book is because they talk about back in medicine, hysterectomy is for a woman that's hysteric because they couldn't figure out at the time of the science why the things were happening in the female body and the anatomy and the hormones. This is 
from medieval times, I think it has stemmed from periods of time. So I appreciate you sharing that um, story. I think it's probably very, it can be common and we have to be aware of it so that we can stand up for ourselves and make sure that we don't believe the wrong things. Um, and so uh, I appreciate that. I know that um, in Arizona, you guys, so Live and Learn is based in Arizona. Celeste, when did you start working with them? Um, six months ago. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah, so I know that you had, um, with the domestic violence conversation, there was um, maybe Iris too, if there's anything you wanted to share as far as just statistics or what's happening in these homes today and how you guys are helping women with facing some of these things that we're talking about. The number one thing that we do at Live and Learn that is so powerful is the our clients have like self-determined goals, right? They come to us because they want to make a change in their life, right? They want to expand their education, their career. You know, they want to create this life for their children that's different than maybe what they've had. And that economic freedom um, buys a lot of choices that they mm -hmm. can then, where they can access, you know, where they're living, where their kids go to school, you know, even career choices when their education is more advanced, that kind of thing. And so um, with domestic violence in particular, like women can be, they might come to us in the middle of an abusive relationship that they don't even recognize as being abusive. They might be trying to get out. They might have come from that in the past. It might be something they haven't experienced. I mean, because of course that's not always part of, you know, every woman's story, but um mm -hmm. But I heard a story from um, one of my coworkers about a client who the whole time she was working with us and building her um, building her resume. And I mean, in terms of like her work experience and um, saving money and learning all these things, she was preparing to leave an abusive relationship. We didn't even know that that wasn't part of like what she was here for wow. exactly but it absolutely was too and so um so i think that kind of uh those opportunities for once that for one that women can make their choices about what they want to do where their passions are the direction they want to go for themselves and then how much um, more opportunity that they have in their lives to make their own decisions when they have that kind of independence and so um, even in future relationships, even if they, you know, end up meeting yeah. somebody and those red flags start going, they're like, wait, this doesn't feel safe. Like there's a whole, they have all their own resources, you yeah. know, that they have accumulated and that they know and that they're theirs, you know, and so they're just that vulnerability is reduced some. Um, there's still the, you know, all the cultural components and things that are kind of transcend that, but, um, mm -hmm. but it still gives women, um, the opportunity for um, more choices for themselves and to have that um, independence. I, I, what I love about it is I like the two year. It's a, usually a two year program, right? Mm -hmm. Often, no. because if you do cl classes, are still important. If there's a way to take a class here and there, and I know there's other organizations, even locally too, that can help. But sometimes one class or a couple months is not enough time because there's so many things that could be changing. So. That's one thing I do love about your program. But I feel like, Celeste, when you're talking, I feel like you guys are giving confidence to people to really, you're a third party validating. This is not okay behavior. So whether or not this person, the client is sharing, hey, I'm planning to leave. It was almost like she didn't even have to, I don't think, because you guys were doing the work and helping her in so many other ways. Maybe that's why she didn't have to share it because you were giving them her the tools, the family, the tools needed. So that's really neat. Is there anything else you want to share about the program or IRIS? Um, yeah. Just what you guys are working on. Um, well, we have a couple things coming up that are really exciting, and I'll let Celeste share about that a little bit. But I do want to tell you guys a story about a woman that I worked with a couple of years ago when I started working at Live and Learn. I was a client coordinator at the time, but her name was Jessica. And Jessica came into the program, just really wanted to get a degree and wanting to do better for her family. Um, as with most domestic violence um, survivors, they're not always open about what's going on and they might not feel safe or comfortable to share. 
Um, we kind of identified early on that something was going on, but she was not ready and willing to share at the time. Um, Jessica worked with me for a while, and about a year in, she finally let us know that she was actually in a very abusive relationship, um, that she actually had decided to become a substance abuse counselor because her partner was a drug addict, and this was affecting her family, her children, herself, and when she was halfway through the program, she finally decided to leave that relationship. And so it goes again to say to show that if you're there to support them through their journeys that they're setting, when they're ready and they have the resources needed, they are able to get out of those situations. And Jessica, at that point, when she did leave that relationship, she had the tools needed to leave and stay out of that relationship right. because she was financially self-sufficient at that point, mm, which we that. know at Live and Learn, and you know it's known that. Um, you know, financial dependency is the main reason where we, why women stay in abusive relationships. Yeah. So thanks for sharing that. That's really neat. Yeah. No, I love Jessica. She recently reached back out. She's uh, actually moved to another state. She's working for a local nonprofit where she lives at, and she's doing amazing things. She has three small children. They're all doing great. And she just said, you know what, Iris, like, thank you and thank Live and Learn for everything that you guys were able to support me with. And, you know, even though sometimes we might feel a little bit of frustration, right? Like, I know something's going on. I want to help her. I want to do. Why doesn't she leave if we're there to support them? If we're there, right, to help them through their, like Celeste mentioned, their, their self-determined goals, um, they are able to make the choices that are best for them to mm -hmm. get them to a better place for their, themselves and their families. But I don't know, Celeste, if you want to share a little bit about our new partner um, that we recently joined the coalition. Oh, great. Yeah. Let's hear, let's hear more about that. Yeah. So we became members of the Arizona Coalition to End Sexual and Domestic Violence, um, which is great. Uh, personally, like I, I volunteered with them. I was on their board for a few years and did and most of the work I did with domestic violence survivors was through the coalition. And so it's really exciting that now that we've just become members and um, and so mm -hmm. it gives us additional resources as an agency in terms of um, access to the um, most um, I don't know if cutting edge is quite the right word. That's just what comes to mind. But, you know, the, the leading um, thoughts and ideas around domestic violence and that, you know, work. The advocacy is big. Yeah. 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 And so um, so it's really cool. So we've got um, it's a, just it's a fun partnership. We've got some um, we've got some grant money from the coalition. It's through um, oh, cool. it's federal like uh, COVID, um, you know, frustration money, you know, that is going through the county to different programs that are helping um, people who are working with um, victims and survivors of domestic violence. And so, um, yeah, and I think it's just, it's adding that, um, that element. One thing that Live and Learn does that I think is so important, and I think about, like I was talking about, you know, when me believing that I was crazy, right, and that I really did not, my understanding of reality was completely off. There was something about seeing other people, other women living lives that were more like what I envisioned for myself that helped me hear like the voice in my head that was like, this guy is wrong about you. Like, this is not what you deserve. Like, this isn't like you, the spirit of who you are is much greater than this. And so I think even with Live and Learn coming to like our events and being involved with our client coordinators, like our clients who might be experiencing someone holding that power and control over them, like we're modeling this, you know, independent, yeah. you know, um, free life of being free mm -hmm. from that. And, um, and, it, and we have no way of knowing really what that effect is on somebody that, but by seeing that and by, by us living that and being that, then, um, and all the other clients, you know, that they might be around and other people that they interact with through Live and Learn, like we can give that, um, that seed. And we don't really talk about it like that, but I'm just thinking about my experiences and how much um, we might be giving hope to people that we don't even realize just by by living the life that we're talking about you know having access to it, that's so. my brain is going hope and possibilities mm -hmm. yeah. 
the, the, the community aspect, when I was putting together Pathways, it was really around COVID. It's kind of like the collection of the greatest hits of all these things I was seeing happening around me. The network, if, if you, so mm-hmm. if we have a story to share, I feel like we need to share it because we never know what that's going to do for another person. Because if you can see someone that else that's been there, there's possibilities, there's that hope, then hopefully with the personal development and kind of working through the program, or other resources too, but through like the coalition, I know they had some resources or toolboxes. I saw um, some kits online, but that should hopefully have someone, you have the ability to step outside and kind of see that it is possible for you to do better and, and have more. And so that is, that's where I hope is, and that's part of the Hope Blooms um, theme too that we have, that Live and Learn has. So that's really powerful. It's really cool. Yeah, that's our our tagline is hope with an action plan. And I love that so much because everybody talks about hope, hope, hope. But, you know, we have to put some action behind it. And the reality is that the women that come to our program are determined to have a better future for themselves. And so they are willing to put in the action that is needed. Right. And to Mm -hmm. do the steps that are necessary to get to where they want to be. And so we're incredibly blessed to be able to work with women that are so determined, hardworking, and to get to see the impact and the change in their lives um, daily. Yeah. Okay, so it sounds like we have a few ways. We have Live and Learn, the organization itself. And Iris and I talk a little bit about Hope Blooms, so we'll be sharing more about that on social media. Mm -hmm. And then now with the, the advocacy of the coalition, the acronym, Celeste, is it, what's the acronym for the uh, group that we, that Live and Learn just partnered with? Oh, um, it's ACESDV. Okay. ACES, 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 but, uh, I know that we. The, yeah, Arizona Coalition and Sexual and Domestic Violence. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, I know, okay, that's a long one, so we'll link that up too. So Great. I am always happy to introduce people to the, the groups and the communities we're talking about. I know that I'm actively participating, and so there are, I'll be sharing more things that I, as I can through the podcast and on my social media to allow people to get a chance to advocate and help donate and, and do more. So um, I, I really appreciate you guys sharing some of the personal stories and can't wait to do more with you guys. So um, for the listeners, I appreciate you being here, and if you have any questions on how to get involved, Uh, you'll have resources or just reach out to me directly. So thank you so much for being here, ladies. Thank you so much for having us. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Amber. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of the Amber Stitch Show. For more information about the podcast, books, articles, and more, please visit me at amberstitt.com. Until next week, enjoy your journey at home and at work. Thank you for listening.